I walk in, everyone's in business professional. I've got on like a cowboys, like, like I look like a Western guy with a hat on. I got on boots, notes, loafers. And as soon as we kick it off, I'm not kidding you, power in the building, down. My brain defaults to 12-year-old Rocky. You should not be surprised that things are not going the way that you expected. But you've already proven to yourself that when things go other than expected, you know you're going to be okay. That's what's going on in my brain. The next 10 seconds in my mouth is, yo, what's up, everybody? Those in the back, can you hear me? Yeah, we got you. Great. Here's what we're gonna do. We don't need any of this stuff because we came here today to do an exploration of who we are, what that means and why that matters. And if we think that we're gonna find it on a screen, we're wrong. Welcome to another exciting episode of the Eternal Optimist Podcast. My guest today is Mr. Rocky Garza from the Texas. Uh, Rocky, how are you today, my friend? I'm wonderful, my man. How you doing? Thanks so much for having me. Dude, we're kicking butt today. And I'm curious, right before we jumped on this call, you were doing something and then a series of events happened. Can you describe to us what you've been doing for the past hour and then the the challenges that happened in switching over to our podcast? Just what's been happening? Yeah, welcome to my life. Yeah, so the last hour I've been working with San uh, Bernardino Valley College. It was their Hispanic Heritage Month celebration. And so I I did a live uh, virtual keynote for all of their folks there at the college um, for that. And so it was, it was awesome. We talked about building confidence and, uh, what are the stories we tell ourselves, and, how, and what are the stories told to us and how does that create doubt? And really how do we unpack and write a next chapter of our life without removing the history and the legacy of what's come before us? Let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. How do we leverage our, the reflection of our experience allows us to know who we are what we are doing moving forward allows us to understand who we want to become, right? And so we, we unpacked that. So I did that. I hung up, had it back to back, closed it off, hit pause on my camera that I'm recording my own content, hit record again. I thought, I'm going to sit down with my boy, Matt. I've been standing. I dropped the old standing desk down, hit the, hit the number two setting. It starts going down. The back of my desk catches the tripod. I yep. see my screen and camera coming all towards me. And so I had to hit the pause, grab the screen, pop it over. No one died. Nothing broke. <laughs> However, you and I hopped on here and my webcam somehow got unplugged in the mix. And now we're back. Boom. Piece of cake. Piece of cake. Piece of cake. Uh, as Jocko would say, good. Challenges, pfft. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Good. I, I'm curious. You're a professional speaker, and I'm looking at your website, and I just want to shout this out to to everyone listening. Is that this is what it says on Rocky's website? He's got 15 years of experience and has coached over 1,000 people in the last 15 years. He's spoken to over 50,000 people in the last 15 years, and he's spoken to over 100 teams in one day, like full team events. So. He has a breadth of experience. That that's who you're hearing from today. And and I'm curious if you could go back into the to memory banks here. Tell us about a time when you had uh, a, a a keynote where things did not go the way you might have wanted them. Technology conked out or whatever it is. What's what's the challenging story of being giving a keynote for you? Yeah, so I was in Chicago, Illinois. It was for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois. I was at their headquarters office. It was the first time being asked to speak there. I flew in, feeling good, went past the bean, saw myself, yo, what's up? It looks nice. Really, that was looking at myself. So of course I look nice. I get inside, I go <laughs> in, I walk in, and and we got about 250 top salespeople from Blue Cross Blue Shield. Now, this is kind of early on in my career. I used to have this hat, this Stetson that I wore. Um, I didn't wear slacks, I didn't own a sports coat. So like I walk in and I walk into a room and I'm like, yo, this is not going to work. Like I'm going to spend, I have three hours to do a workshop, right? Cause I don't, I don't really do anything in a short amount of time. So I got three hours with this group. We're going to do a workshop. I walk in, everyone's in business professional. I've got on like cowboys, like, like I look like a Western guy with a hat on. I got on boots, notes, loafers. And as soon as we kick it off, I'm not kidding you. Power in the building <laughs> down. Like nothing, bro. We got no lights. We got no AV, no microphone, nothing. And we're like, where's no, no option. We can't just stop and wait. Like we got to keep going. So call an audible. <laughs> we change. I sell as we go center room. Cause the, the windows are like behind us. Right. So they can see me, but they're dark. So I say, here's what I need everybody to do. 
sometimes, and we just pivot with it. Sometimes we're going to lose energy and power and we're not going to have what we need in order to accomplish the goal, but that doesn't mean we can't do it. So mm -hmm. everybody turn their chairs to the middle. I get off the stage, no microphone. I'm just yelling at these folks for the next three hours. We go workshop. I'm working the crowd, going between tables. At some point, I'm sitting on a table talking to somebody because we have to. And you know, at the end of the day, it was interactive. I took so many things from that that I'm like, the next keynote I'm doing, I don't care if I have electricity or not. I can tell you what I'm not doing. Standing on this stage with that podium is what I'm not doing. I'm working the crowd. I'm freaking Tony Robbins in this thing. So it, a lot of great things came from that environment experience. But uh, you know, losing the power, losing the power, and having nothing just at the drop of a hat when they introduce you. Yeah, we'll set the stage to see what's coming next. Yeah, walk me through at that exact moment. You're you're on stage, you're feeling there's something just different in this moment. And then the moment the power goes out, like what's the the first next next 10 seconds? What happens in your brain? What comes out of your mouth in the next like 10 to 30 seconds? Yeah, so to, let's go two things. Let's go what happens to my brain in the first okay. 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. My brain defaults to 12-year-old Rocky. You should not be surprised that things are not going the way that you expected, but you've already proven to yourself that when things go other than expected, you know you're going to be okay. That's what's going on in my brain. Okay. The hmm. next 10 seconds in my mouth is, yo, what's up, everybody? Those in the back, can you hear me? Yeah, we got you. Great. Here's what we're going to do. We don't need any of this stuff because we came here today to do an exploration of who we are, what that means and why that matters. And if we think that we're gonna find it on a screen, we're wrong. It's gonna take us pivoting and doing some deep work inside. I need you to get your chairs and let's turn them to the middle. But I think those two things for me often in my brain is this recalculation, this recalibration, this um, life has already shown me that things aren't going to go the way that we plan all the time. Plans are awesome. Don't get me wrong. I love a good plan. I love going on vacation with my wife because baby girl loves a good plan. She's got it dialed in for us. And I love a good scrap the restaurant, grab a hot dog, sit in the park, see what happens. We'll be good. But I think history and life has shown me that that's what it takes to survive. But you get 40 years down the road and you recognize maybe my greatest survival skill could be my greatest strength which could actually be the way that I create the greatest amount of impact in somebody else's life. Mm -hmm. Amazing. I love it. it. It makes me want to ask you, well, first, it makes me want to ask you, uh, if you take us back to uh, your origin story and mm. how you became the Rocky Garza that we are listening to today, this, this man who's able to, when the tripwire hits and the stuff hits the fan, you go to, when things go other than expected, I'm, I'm prepared. I, I've done this before. I, mm. I take us back to how that person was born and the challenging circumstances that are kind of the defining moments on that path. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Great, great question. Um, so I was, uh, I was born in Kansas, but I only lived there for about a week. So I don't really claim Kansas. I came to Dallas right after that. So, sure. um, don't know much about Kansas. Hadn't been back yet. So, uh, but I came back to the Dallas area. Um, it was where my grandparents lived. My grandparents being my mom's parents, um, okay. came back and moved there. And then subsequently over the next few, few years, uh, my parents got divorced right before I turned two. Um, and so, uh, I didn't never live with my dad growing up. Uh, I guess after that moment, I've never lived with my dad ever. Um, since then, uh, my mom has been married and divorced five times. And so we moved a bunch growing up, went to 13 schools where I graduated high school. Um, and most of those pre seventh grade, um, just cause my mom was married and divorced and, or a different job. And so we moved cities, we moved to this guy, we moved for this job and so on. And it was, you know, to her house and back to my grandparents then to another city, then back to my grandparents and her, another city, another city back to my grandparents. So we played that game for a while up until seventh grade. And so, you know, for me, like I didn't rec I didn't know that the first day of school didn't mean the first day at a school until seventh grade. Like I didn't realize it was like a marker of time for all of us. I thought it was a statement of truth about what we were doing. And so when I began to see really for me, and, and you know, we, we, we know, and we learned that between the ages of six and 12 is what we learned, what we learned to be true about the world in that time tends to be a really great reflection of how we operate as an adult. So I, between six and 12, what I learned was if I could outthink you, out, out, outsmart you, outwit you, out charisma you, I could at the time what I believed to be vulnerable 
come to find out later in life through lots of therapy and counseling was simply disclosure. We can unpack that later if you want. I recognized I was great at disclosure so because I, I was trying to survive. I had to get there, make a friend, make a connection, give you everything I could give you in the shortest amount of time to draw you in so that you would say, do you want to come to a sleepover this weekend? Yes, I do. Because I might only have four weekends while I'm here. Let's make the best of it. Now, when you're seven or eight, you're not that conscious, but life says be conscious enough to wake or look around, right? Like mm-hmm. I remember mm-hmm. I was 11. I wanted to be on the Yankees, Little League Baseball team. They were blue. They had the best team, the best jerseys. The <laughs> bank is the one who supported them. You know, when you used to have the name on the back of the thing, oh, yeah. I want to be on their team. I remember the coach telling me, you can't be on the Yankees, Rocky, for two reasons, son. I mean, I remember his face. He said, you can't be on the Yankees because number one, you throw like a girl. I don't know who taught you how to throw, but you throw like a girl. Side note, my mom taught me how to throw because my mom is the one playing baseball with me. Okay. Number two, he said, you can't be on the team because we've been playing together since we were five. So we have a pretty good dynamic. I think the White Sox would be a better team for you to join. Mm. And I think for me, that's a really good picture as I reflect back growing up, let me be clear. My life was okay. My grandparents are amazing. I never went without anything that I needed by living. My grandparents typically got what I wanted. I had the greatest Tommy Hilfiger polo collection from Ross you could ever desire. I mean, I was slain (laughs) in the middle school. Okay. So like, let's be clear. I had what I needed, but the greatest freedom I felt at the age of 32 was going through therapy. And my counselor saying to me, Rocky, have you ever said out loud, your mom abandoned you? And I know she didn't leave you on the side of the road per se, but she consistently made decisions in your life where she chose something other than you and that's abandonment. And it was the most freeing statement I've ever said in my life out loud because it released from me what felt like was my fault. Mm. When I recognized for the first time that the stories that had been told to me about me were a greater reflection of the storyteller than they were the character of the story. Mm. And I had been living my whole life based as the character of the story, living somebody else's line. Wow. So for me, went back to my grandparents, lived with them seventh grade through high school, graduated, uh, went off to college, uh, went to junior college for a couple of years, went to Texas A&M for a couple of years, graduated from there. I was a counselor at a summer camp right out of college, met a girl, got engaged, started dating, started dating, got engaged, was at that camp. Come to find out after I engaged in pictures, she called me one night and said, I have something to tell you. She said, my mom told me that if I didn't tell you that I was sleeping with someone else, then she wasn't going to put a deposit down on our venue. I said, okay. My first relationship doing it right. I'm trying to do it the right way. I'm not going to sleep around. I'm going to be with you. We're going to get married. We're going to hone in. We're really going to. And then boom, like, just kidding, bro. That's not how you do it. I remember thinking like, this is it. That's what I get. That's what I get for the way that I lived. This is what's going to happen to me. Right. Come to find out it's not true, but in the moment, that's very much how it felt. So I ended up leaving Sky Ranch, came back to Dallas. I was on pastoral staff at a church here in Dallas uh, for about three years or so. Um, During that time, as when I met my wife, we got, we started dating, we got engaged, we got married in 2009. Uh, So we've been married right at 14 years. Uh, It was July 25th of this year, married for 14 years. Um, I was, uh, yeah, let's go. (laughs) Pretty good at marriage. I'm slaying it right now. Uh, So um, we, uh, while I was at Chase Soaks, I got offered a teaching pastor job. Uh, I was 26, one tattoo, had a faux hawk. Uh, I was primed to be a teaching pastor <laughs> at a Southern Evangelical non-denominational church. Uh, uh, but I wasn't super self-aware, but I was self-aware enough to know that I was a jerk mm. and that I was way more interested in you shaking my hand when I walked off stage and telling me that I was awesome than I actually was, had the desire to teach you about the Bible. Okay. Um, and I don't know if I could have said it that eloquently, but I knew I felt that in my bones. And okay. so uh, they said, hey, we got a promotion for you. Do you want the job? And I said, unfortunately, no. I can't say yes to this because it's going to be bad for you and bad for me. And really? Something else. So you had enough self-awareness yeah. to know that at that time and you still that you hadn't gone through the metamorphosis yet, but you were aware enough Correct. to know that it was Correct. it was for you. Okay. I knew there was some, it was aware enough to know something about this isn't, isn't going to be good. Okay. And so... Um, my wife had quit her job about a year before started doing photography. So naturally when you get done being a pastor, what do you do? You become a wedding photographer. So, uh, we did that full time for about five years pre kids. Um, and it was really started the start of our entrepreneurial journey. That was in 2010. Um, 
And, uh, you know, we kind of rode the wave of personal branding. We rode the wave of Pinterest. We started shooting weddings before Pinterest was invented. Uh, yeah. so, um, Instagram had just come out. So we, we really got lucky in, in our own in naivety that we got to kind of ride the wave of this online thing that you could do and it didn't exist yet. And so, but for me, that really forged this path of understanding self and brand and who you are and what that means and how do you communicate it. And which really has led to a lot of the work I do now with individuals and teams is you got to yes. understand who you are before you can go make a plan about what you're going to go do. This is so amazing to me, that, that wedding photographer, and, and they're getting ready to go to this the great know, executive leader. What, but just out of curiosity, <laughs> what, what, is, what is the life of a wedding photographer entrepreneur couple for five years? What is what's, What goes into that? I have no idea. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. One? So, so yeah. So we, uh, well, you shoot weddings almost every Saturday. We, we shot about Saturday. 40 weddings a year for five years. Um, okay. and during that for us, about half of those were destinations. So about 20 weddings a year were in Texas and 20 were on a plane somewhere. We were going either across the U S or somewhere around the world to shoot photograph someone's wedding. So it was awesome. Wow. We traveled, somebody else paid for it. And really for us, when I look back at that time, you know, you shoot weddings on Saturday, I get engagement sessions on Tuesday, Wednesday, the occasional bridal session, because in the South, that's what you do. You take pictures by yourself in your wedding dress before you get married so that your mom can put one in the hallway. So like those are kind of the three main things. And you shoot weddings on Saturdays and you cull through images and you edit images and then you go shoot it again. It's just kind of this, you get the flow down, it, it begins to work. For awesome. us though, I look back at wedding photography, that season of our life was possibly the most transformative five years we've ever had individually and as a couple. Uh, we both we both went to therapy for about three or four years together individually. We went to therapy together to figure out who we were. Uh, I was leading a recovery program at the church I was at at the time. I did that for about three and a half years. So you kind of go through it six or seven times. You start to kind of figure out and look at your own demons because you're leading everybody else to it. So you figure out at this point, I might as well do the work. Um, we didn't have kids yet. And we were really fortunate. We could go to counseling on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. We could spend Thursday in bed crying or figuring out who we were or processing. And no one was pressuring us to get on get online or hit the office. And we'd have Friday to relax. We'd shoot a wedding on Saturday, travel someplace fun and do it all over again while spending 24 hours a day together. And so for us, I think it was really, really really formative in, in our marriage and what we have now, one, because we worked together 24 seven for almost a decade. And two, uh, I think because in that, like we did a lot of deep work pre kids that when we had kids, yeah. it was not perfect. Don't get me wrong. Kids are change everything about who you are. However, <laughs> we were the most prepared to be the most us. Wow, that's so, such an and amazing story. That has, wow. That has been a, a crazy catalyst to the work that I do now. My wife owns her own interior design company. She's got a few people on her team uh, that she works with because she was an interior designer pre doing photography. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of where that was the, the origin of kind of where Rocky Garza came from. And so when we uh, found out we were pregnant with our son in 2015, my wife said, do we really want to shoot 40 weddings a year and have kids? And I was like, no way. And so um, I did not say this eloquently, although I would like to believe that I did Matt. Uh, she said, if you could do anything, what would you want to do? And I said something not like this, but I pretend that I did. Uh, I said, if I could take my life experience, which I appreciate you giving me the chance to share some of that with you. If I could marry that with eight years of ministry, which I just define as deeply caring for people and marry that with, at this point, six or seven years of entrepreneurship, if I could jam all those things together and attempt to spend my life becoming an expert at anything, I want to be a people expert. I want to find a way to help people understand who they are, what that means. And if we can be on a constant journey and discovery to see ourselves and know that we are good at our core, can you imagine the work and the impact that we could create if that's the belief we started our day with? Now, we know I didn't say that eloquently. I probably said like, oh no, I'm gonna get a Squarespace site and put it on Facebook and tell people I'm gonna help them. That's probably what I said. But in the <laughs> moment, it felt that eloquent in yeah. my mind. And yes. so I say I launched my business in 2015, which really just means I put on Facebook that I had a new website. Um, but I started working with creative <laughs> entrepreneurs because that was the world I came out of. Yeah. It was a pretty easy sell to go to another photographer and go, did you see our business? Did you like it? Do you want one like that? I can help you with that. And so I just kind of jumped off the deep end and said, hey, we're gonna go on a two-day retreat, me and you one-on-one. -on -one. I'm gonna walk you through a process called Identity Map which I was like creating as the business was going. Yep. Um, and once we go through that, then we can create a plan for your business and we'll do coaching for six months. I think I charged $1,100 for my first time for a two day retreat and six months of coaching because I thought I was rich. Um, and um, looking back wow. is like, what was I even, what, what was I thinking? How did I make that work? But at the time, you know, I guess your expenses are less and you made it work because it was, you're trying to figure it out. And so That's right. That's started right. that in 2015 and um, end, of, end of 14, early 15. So the last eight or nine years or so. Um, have nice. done that, have spent my time speaking, coaching, and, and working with individuals through the process of identity mapping first to help them get a clear picture of, of who they are and how they want to spend their life in order to build a life they really believe in. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. 
And I, I want to wind it back for a second here and, and build a little commonality here because th this is such a rare treat for me to, to meet someone, Rocky, that has moved as much as you moved because I did the same thing. You said 13 mm. times by seventh grade. That that was not me. I was 13 times uh, or 17 times in 21 years, but 13 different mm. schools by high school. So that was mm. amazing to finally meet someone that knows what it's like to go to a different place for different reasons, but to go to a different place all the time. So experiences may have been somewhat in a, in a parallel universe. Uh, and then I started my coaching business in 2014 as well. So uh, a couple of things wow. there. Man, I'm just loving this story. You mentioned uh, the word disclosure. You said, come back to that if you want to. So I'm, I'm curious mm. what you meant by, you just unpack disclosure for us for a little while. Yeah. So I think oftentimes, especially folks that are good and effective communicators, um, and, and those of us that, that we, we are one of our survival mechanisms. And I want to be clear when I say survival mechanism, I'm not referencing that we're doing anything false, wrong, or fake. We are doing exactly what we know in order to keep ourselves alive, even if it's just emotionally or, or, or mentally alive. But I think w those of us that utilize our tend to utilize our words as a mechanism for survival, tend to be really good at disclosure. I am great at getting a set of information, giving that set of information in such a way over and over and over and over and over that when you hear it for the first time, you think, God, that guy just shared his whole life with me. Mm -hmm. Yet if you were, had been around yesterday, I said the exact same thing, the exact same way to elicit the same response because I found early on in my life, if I could communicate what to you felt like very vulnerable information mm -hmm. in a way that for me had lost its element of vulnerability because it was simply information and data, that would build a connection between the two of us where you automatically trusted me because you, re you thought that I was somebody who was willing to go deep. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I could disclose information in a way that allowed me to be safe because now you felt connected to me but I had given you nothing so that mm. if I left or you left, you couldn't hurt me like everyone else. Mm. To me, the flip side of that is you get uh, far enough in life and realize you start telling the same story the same way to enough people. Mm -hmm. You find yourself alone. You find yourself isolated and you recognize that nobody believes it anymore because you didn't actually allow anyone into your life. You simply invited them to read the sign that described you. And for me, vulnerability began to say, it's not simply the exposure of weakness, but rather my greatest opportunity for growth. If I'm actually willing to share with someone where I'm standing today, not just all the places I have stood before, I want to invite you into now. Mm. I, think, I think vulnerability requires two things. It requires invitation and proximity. Okay. Invitation that says, hey, will you join me in this? And proximity that says, and I want to allow myself to be close enough in proximity so that you can actually see where my feet are now. Disclosure says, look at the path I walked. Vulnerability says, look at the place I'm standing. And if we get wild, may I share with you the place I think I want to go? Then we create some magic because now we've invited someone to actually go with us. Wow. Love it. I love you unpack that. Thank you. There's great depth there. When that self-awareness, you were aware through all these years of being able to disclose what you needed to disclose to survive and or mm -hmm. be in that environment and be safe and protect yourself. And then I go back to your story. You mentioned that in the five-year wedding, that was a transformational time in your life. Is mm -hmm. that when you started to unpack and become more vulnerable through the therapy? Is that what got you to the vulnerability place you yeah, are now? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a hundred percent. I mean, my, my wife started going to counseling because there were things in her life that she wanted to unpack that we thought were impacting our marriage. And so I was like, yeah, yeah babe, go, I got you, you go figure it out. And so she had probably, she had been going a year. And so her, her counselor was like, Hey, bring Rocky with you next time. Just so we can talk about like, cause I'd be like, Hey, I don't know. You get home and you're crying. Yeah, like, I don't know what to do. What do you, I don't know what to do with you. What do you need? You want me to be with you? I'm going to be away from you. You want time alone? You want me to leave? You want me to like, and so she was like, Hey, bring Rocky with me and we can help unpack like what he can do to support you. Yeah. Great. So I go, I get in, she's asked a couple of questions. My wife is talking. She asked me a question. I'm like, yeah, you know, like for me, my dad and my mom. And I was like, Hey, but she was like, maybe you should come back next week. And I was like, I think you're right. I think there are things I have disclosed to everyone. And for some reason this time I tried to disclose the same information to you, but because I was sitting with my wife presently, it no longer was a story about history. It was a story about now. I'm starting to feel something here. And the implication here. Yeah. of that, 
like okay. all of a sudden was like, wait a second, you now that you know and you are aware, ignorance is no longer your friend. Because now, if you have awareness and you ignore it, it's not ignorance. It's a conscious decision that you don't want to face what's in front of you. Wow. And so for me, it was like, I, I got I to gotta unpack this. Like, I got to get in here. I don't even know. You're right. I felt things. I, let me back up. I felt things. Yeah. Yeah. Leave it at that. Yeah. Well, and the- I hadn't felt things in a long time. I relate. I relate totally to this. And and at some point at that conversation, you had to go for it. You were present, you were there, you went for it, you shared mm-hmm. it. And now you're in and you go to the first therapy session and to whatever extent you're able to share, what was that first time when you were asked a question that you've been disclosing for a long time and now the vulnerability came yeah. out for the first time? Yeah, I th- yeah, I think I think it, uh, go back just a little bit because I think okay. the an impetus a, a, a moment that really sparked it. So right okay. before my wife and I got married, I went to counseling by myself because okay. I was going to be a good husband. So um, uh, we did like our premarital thing, but like Rocky's going to go to counseling. Like I'm going to I'm going to joke out there because I want to get myself right. So I go to counseling, and this is probably our third or fourth session. And I remember this this older gentleman he's sitting across from me, and he asked me really very calmly. He said, "Rocky, just tell me like you know you're getting married here in the next month or so, like." And tell me why you're excited about getting married, you know? And I didn't, bro, Matt, I didn't even take a breath. I mean, I was thought I was about to slay this answer so much. <sighs> I looked across over and I said, oh, easy question, man. Appreciate that, bro. Uh, man, because I cannot wait to prove to my mom that I'm not like her husband's and to my dad that I'm not like him. Wow. And he just looked, he just looked at me. And then about 30 seconds of what felt like nine hours, about 30 seconds later, he's still looking at me and I see one tear come down his face. And I'm thinking, bro, what just happened? Because I feel like I just gave a fire answer and he's crying. Yeah. And so I'm like, I'm just, I'm not trying to hold it. I'm right, right. I'm like, I don't say anything. Like, don't matter. Like, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe he's, maybe it's a good cry. Maybe he's so proud of you. He's crying. <laughs> and he says, that makes me really sad. And I said, okay, why? And he said, because I asked you why you wanted to marry your wife and you didn't talk about your wife. Mm. Mm. I guess you're right. He said, so maybe next week we'll unpack that a little bit. And there was no next week. Yeah. And so it wasn't until about 24, 30 months later after being married and my wife being the amazing person that she is taking the leap herself and trying to figure some things out. I find myself sitting next to my wife realizing, I think this is what he meant. There's yeah. something here that I need to unpack and now is as good a time as any. For our listeners out there, I, I've, I've got a tear in my eye thinking about that because I didn't go to that therapy session myself. And my answer to a number of relationships in my 20s and maybe even early 30s leading up to when I met my wife and I was able to be real uh, may have been very similar. Mm. And yeah, I'm glad that we had to go through that to get to where we are now. And 100%. 100%. To. Yeah, I think... Yeah, you know, uh, uh, it's going to sound a little cheesy because it is a little cheesy because I'm thinking about a slide that, you know, just that we talked about the talk that I just had before this. But one thing that I feel like I I tell myself often is that uh, like a doubt, a doubt filled life is one where I spend my energy trying to convince me, trying to convince you of who I am. Mm. And And the life lived with deep conviction is one where I spend my energy walking in the freedom of what I already know to be true about who I am. Mm. And I lived a lot of my life that was just doubt filled, dude, just so riddled yeah. with attempting to prove to you why I was good and valuable, yeah. trying to show you that you could trust me and you needed me and I got you and don't worry. And I got, I'll figure it out. Right. I had a really good friend of mine. Uh, he actually is at, at 49 now. Um, and uh, he's a good friend of mine. And we were talking a couple of weeks ago and he said, Rocky, I don't know who, who told you this. 
but you do know that it's not possible for you to be a jack of all trades and a master of all, right? And I said, I don't know. No, I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take that in from you, buddy. But I'm going to also like, it's, I don't like that. I don't like that at all. Mm. But I think you're right that I spent a lot of my life trying to be a jack of all trades and also a master of all. Cause I thought if I didn't, you wouldn't love me. And if you didn't love me, you would leave. And if you leave now, here we are again, Rocky at home in his apartment by himself, making a snack. Mm. Wow. This is uh this has gone deep and I've greatly appreciative of everything that you've shared in, in my experience, just from my lens, this is what I would call vulnerability. So I definitely appreciate that. And I want to make the introduction to my friend. I, I was just on his show a minute ago, the vulnerable man podcast. So this is awesome uh, that you're going this vulnerable. So thank you. And so our audience is getting a chance to meet Rocky now, someone who has done the work and who's learned the emotional intelligence. I wanted to take all that time to, to share the journey with him or ask him to share the journey because you know, this is what we see now, but he had to do the hard work. And if anyone's listening and they're wondering how to do the hard work, you're listening to someone who has done the hard work. You know, I'd love to transition, Rocky, and talk a little bit about your coaching practice and what's happened since 2015, the last like eight or nine years. Talk about uh, that development and what you do now. I'd love to, love to hear that story. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Let me, I want to make one, one caveat to what you said, though. Mm -hmm. uh, and I am someone who has done some work, mm -hmm. and I am someone who is daily doing the work still. Uh, and I know that's what you meant because I know you're a person. I, I do, you know, people, we got some mutual friends and like, I know that, I know that's you too. And I know that you're doing the work consistently too, but I just want to make sure for folks that uh, are listening, um, there is no arrival. There is no <laughs> yeah. arrival on self-development. There is no arrival on, okay, you went to counseling, you, you crushed the demon and now you're going to be free the rest of your life. But, no, that's just, I, at least, at least not in my experience, I've, I, I haven't, I haven't found that to be the case. Now, do I have tools and resources I didn't have a decade ago that give me the ability to overcome said obstacle exponentially faster? 100%. Mm -hmm. But the obstacle is going to present itself and I'm going to have to find a way to get through it. I am currently, uh, and maybe we can unpack this a little bit later and it, it will decide like, uh, I, I, those of you that are listening now, you're catching me, you're, you're catching me 14 to 21 days into one of the most difficult professional things I've ever had to go through and experience in my life. And I'm, and I'm having to do the work. I'm having to remind myself every single day, multiple times a day, Rocky, remind yourself of who you are. Hmm. Trust who you are. Don't let the actions of another person dictate the reality of who you are. That's not you. And so I say that because I want to make sure that those of you that are listening recognize that no matter what happens and what you do and growth and achievement and possibility, I, 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 we, we coach for a living. So that's our whole idea and destiny is to help you get to where you want to be, the place you think you can't get by yourself. And <clears throat> maybe I will someday find this to be incorrect. But at this point in my life, Matt, I rarely find that anybody that I work with, the coach, consult, or speak is hiring me because I am an expert. Mm -hmm. I am not your expert. I'm not going to lead with my expertise, mm -hmm. but I will absolutely do my best to call you into and draw you into the experience that I am currently living. Mm. And if I think, and I, and I believe there are things that I know, don't get me wrong, there's things I know a lot about, but, mm -hmm. but, but I'm not, but I, I'm 40, I, an expert. I'm not an expert. I'm still trying to figure it out for myself. I got an eight-year-old and a five-year-old and been married for 14 years, but I'm looking for 54 years. And what do I teach them? And how do they fail? And how do I let them fail? And they scratch their knee and it's okay, but what do we do? And how do we, and oh my gosh, like, like join in the experience. Mm -hmm. My hope is that maybe I'm just a step or two ahead of the place you hope to be. And I want to be far enough ahead to warn you about the snake that's on the trail but I want to be close enough that I can grab your hand if you need it. That's the place where I want to live. And maybe that changes when you get older, but at my age at 40, I feel like that's what, that's what, that's what makes me me. So full circle, thinking back to your question, um, 
you know, now, now for me, I, I, I basically spend my time kind of in, in three big buckets. Number one uh, is coaching individuals one on one. So individuals, anybody, I, I call it off the street coaching. I know that's not a very professional thing, but what I mean by that is anybody off the street can hire me to be their coach. You can hire me one on one. Uh, that begins with an identity mapping uh, process, which is a half day we spend together one on one. The process I created, we go through and uncover the clearest language of who you are you've ever had, uh, and then we spend either three, six, or nine months together uh, coaching. Uh, we're about to, uh, probably when you're listening to this, we actually just launched our first group coaching cohort, um, where you can come in, uh, and, uh, join us, uh, it's evergreen. So you come in, there's modules that you get to see and watch online. And then you join us for a weekly call where it's just one hour of application. How do we take what you are learning and apply that to life right here, right now and what we're doing. And those are the two main ways that I, that I spend my time coaching. And again, we'll say a th- 30% of my time is spent that I spend about 30% of my time speaking workshops, um, whether that's a, uh, what I call an internal conversation conference. So Zillow hires me to come and speak at their conference or external conferences. They're going to have a big conference in Vegas that so-and-so is putting on for a hundred entrepreneurs, a thousand entrepreneurs. Again, speaking workshops experience. I love, love the stage. No one should be surprised by that. Love the stage, love the workshop, love the experience, love doing the work right now, nitty gritty in the spot. Let's go answer the question, say it out loud, find the thing in front of everybody. Love that. So spend about a third of my time doing that. Uh, and then the other third is spent um, doing uh, team team identity mapping. So working with groups, teams, executive managing partners, whoever it is, walking them through a full day experience, uh, eight hours, 15 or less in a room, and everybody goes through the individual identity mapping process. But we do it in the context of the group we spend eight hours a day, five days a week with. So we have a chance to see and get vulnerable with each other. And we see the clear language we have for one another. So those are kind of the three main ways uh, uh, of how I spend my time with individuals, groups, teams, and speaking. Um, but for me, you know, to, to make it overtly simple, um, I help high achievers get out of their own way. I think that all of us have some sort of roadblock in front of us that is keeping us. And it may be lack of clarity of ourself. It may be doubt. It may be limiting beliefs. It may be history. It may be that we actually are, uh, if some people, if you're like me, I'm way more afraid of success than I am failure because I failed and I'm fine. But if it really works, dude, if it really works, oh, what are we going to do then? Because because I don't have a lot of models in my life who are really great husbands and really great fathers and really great at business. And Mm. so it's really scary because I get really scared Mm. that if it works, Mm -hmm. like works, works. Yeah. Is that the place? Is that, is that the place holding us back? If you had a model mentor, some, someone that can show you, teach you, is that the place that would give you that certainty? To help you make past I, that point. I definitely think I, I definitely think it's I definitely think it's the place that if I could see find and hold fast to those types of individuals or individual mm-hmm. I definitely think where I'm at today presently on Thursday September 28th 2023 that's the catalyst in my life that I'm looking for to say Rocky look look you're not a bad husband and you're not a bad father so what makes you think you're going to magically become something you're not it's not who you are mm-hmm. and I got to I mean I got to tell myself that three, four, five, 10 times a day to mm-hmm. remind myself that's the case. And, 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 I, and I know it's true in my heart, but, but, but it getting out of there into my brain, into my hands and my feet, that's, that's the place. And that's the, that's the struggle. So I think for me, even, even thinking when I work with individuals or even more coaching, like that's a thing I keep in my mind is like, look, I know what it feels like. I'm, tr- I'm practicing. I'm trying to practice what I preach too on a daily basis that's with a, you. Mm-hmm. So just get, just get in the arena. I don't know. I don't know. But I know I got shields. I got some swords. Some animals are going to creep out of here. Be ready. I'm with you. We got this. Um, but most importantly, you got to get out of your own way so you can get in the arena. Mm. I, I want to say thank you. And I want to say I feel you've just given us a meta learning experience, meaning you've taught us as you are learning and doing it and modeling for us the whole time. This has been Mm. such a treat to see. Thank you. And uh, Mm. I wonder, we go back, you said that the last 14, 21 days in your life have been the real test. Uh, And to the degree that we're willing to, you might have just shared everything right there and left it all on the table. And and I love that. I love you for that. Is there anything else around that to have context or that you could share? in this moment. Yeah, I joined up. Uh, I joined up with an organization, uh, a, a company, about three years ago, uh, and devoted the last three years to coaching and developing the owners of this organization um, uh, the, through their partnership, their own, their ownership, um, 
got asked to consistently take on more, take on more, take on more. So I was coaching through their organization. I was speaking through their organization. I was uh, leading, I created events, uh, both big and small intimate events through their organization. Um, I was leading weekly calls every other Tuesday for this organization. Um, I was leading, developing, and managing all of our executive leadership team, uh, making sure that they were accountable what they were doing. I mean, I, was, I, mean, I, I had said, I'm going to walk away from my own brand because I think I can build something bigger with somebody else. Um, and 14-ish, 20-ish days ago, um, I got a phone call on a Tuesday that said, hey, I just need your help. I said, okay. And they said, can you, can you lay everybody off today? I'm closing the doors um, and we're no longer going to be in business and I'm no longer going to be partners with the person I'm, I'm in partnership with. And so I spent the next 24 hours, uh, you know, walking our staff and team through what that looks like and had an emergency call to let everybody know and called HR and called IT. And that's not, I mean, I'm a 1099 contractor. I'm, I'm not, I, and I get it. Like, I, I don't want that to be a, an excuse of why I shouldn't have been some degree responsible because I would, had been tasked to lead these people, but mm -hmm. it wasn't my company. It wasn't my business. And it's just imploded and it's caused this massive ripple effect. And I'm back to, Thankfully, thankfully, 14 days later, I'm reminding myself that I'm not back to square one. I, I preach all the time. Nobody ever restarts. We just continue. And so I've had to preach to myself, Rocky, you're not restarting. You're just continuing, bro. You just took a tiny hiatus, you know? And so, um, so I'm back, man, I'm back full swing. I'm back full swing on speaking. I'm back full swing on coaching. And thankfully I've had some amazing folks who are like, let's go, let's do it. I'm excited. I can't wait. But nonetheless, like, man, it's been, um, I, I, I gave a, gave a large chunk of my time trying to help some other people build a thing they really believed in. And it didn't end the way that I expected it to end. And I really wasn't prepared at all. And so um, I'm just trying to remind myself that it's not my fault and that um, it's not a reflection of who I am. Um, and the, 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 the fear and the betrayal and, and the lack of trust that I feel is not a reflection of my actions, nor is it a reflection of my character, uh, because I am a trustworthy person. Um, it's what occurred is not because I wasn't trustworthy or because I wasn't doing enough. It was a decision somebody else made. And unfortunately, I just have to face some of the consequences of that decision because of the proximity that I was in. And that's just real life. That's sometimes just how it goes. And so, um, yeah, it's, um, it has been a daily reminder to control what I can control, um, to really refocus. And I will tell you, there are days, man, um, in the last 14 days that I have felt more peace in my life uh, than I have in a long time. Because I look back at the last 40 years and I know what I'm capable of. And I know who I am. And I know what I've done. And I know who my wife is. And I know who my kids are. And I feel an overwhelming amount of peace because not in an arrogant, in an egotistical way. Now is my time. Mm. And I'm going to continue to be who I know that I am. And the reward of that is going to be huge. And the impact of that in people's lives is going to be even bigger. As long as I can consistently remember and remind myself of who I am. Money comes, money will go. There'll be more of it, there'll be less of it. But sometimes when it's just me with me, all I've got is the reality and the truth about the character and nature of who I am. And I've got to be the first person in my life to remind myself that it is good. Everything else will flow from there. I, I feel at this exact moment that everything in life happens for a reason. And I feel that we were meant to have this conversation right now because mm -hmm. I felt for the longest time that this experience that I've had, that it's something that not many others have had. And you just described a very... Uh, viscerally gut-wrenching experience that happened uh, for me. I used to say to me, but it happened for me eerily mm. same fashion uh, about 14 years ago. And mm. it's lived with me ever since. I don't talk about it very much. You know, I can equate it to you know, that House of Cards show in season one, episode one, yeah. where 
the leader of the firm had to go and lay everyone off. And then next thing that happens is they get laid off. Uh, and that actually mm-hmm. happened. Uh, and you just described an eerily similar event. And I, I feel where you're at. The way I responded the next 30 days after that event, uh, well, I felt an enormous sense of peace because finally I didn't have to go and, and crush it for 100 hours a week, seven days a week, forever. And I was single, thank goodness, with no kids. Uh, when I went into a little self-destructive behavior for about a month, uh, and mm-hmm. on day 31, got back to work. And it's, it's, it's great to hear someone so real and raw and share the story, someone that is doing the work and knows they got a lot more to go and they're sharing it. And this is the process, my friends. I'm so glad that Rocky could share this. Mm-hmm. This may be the call to help any one of you. If you go back and listen to this again, this is the place that we are working to get to. To, to be able to feel it and work through it and let it manifest mm. through us, not get stuck in us. So just mm. out of respect, my friend, this is awesome. I've learned so much in this call today. This has been awesome. Uh, okay. Thank I, you, I just got to tell you, I'm, I'm going to take a big deep breath <laughs> because I'm about to go coach girls soccer in about 10 minutes and they are going to get the I best, the most fired I'm up soccer you, team coach bro, they're ever, about <laughs> <laughs> They're about to get it. That's so. So just, just, uh, just so we can make sure you and I stay aligned. The day that I had to make the call and tell everybody was in the parking lot at my son's school on my hotspot with my laptop on the dash. I closed the computer, put it in my bag, and went to coach second grade soccer. Whew. Yeah. So I, 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 and I can tell you this season we've had three practices so far, and this season that was that was practice one. We've had two and three. And I can tell you, we've had more life lessons about accountability and taking responsibility <laughs> this season than we ever have before. Uh, I had a couple of parents this last practice. We got done. We were having a water break and I walked over. There's little bleachers there. And of course, the parents are all there watching. And I had two different parents. You know, there's a group of them sitting there and two of them looked at me and they both kind of simultaneously were like, hey, so, um, uh, yeah, so curious. Um, so do we like, do we owe extra? for like the therapy we're getting in the stands while we're watching what we should be doing with our children. You know, and I'm like, no, 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 no. Sorry, oh, sorry, sorry. Dude, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, well, Rocky, yeah. uh, this is, this has been amazing, man. How do we find out more about you? Where's the places to go to find Rocky Garza? Yeah. So you can just hit me up. You can just hit me up. There's not a lot of bald guys with these eyebrows out there. Even if you're listening, you can't see me, but that's what I look like. Uh, just hit me up at, at Rocky Garza <laughs> on all platforms, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, LinkedIn, YouTube. Um, you can just check out rockygarza.com is the easiest way there. Would love to stay connected with you and how I can serve you. I send a text message every day, Monday through Friday to about a thousand people. So would love for you to hop on board with that. If you want to, would love to get that to you. I see them, I get them, I respond. And then we got a podcast that goes out once a week on Mondays called the weekly rock, uh, which is just, uh, me taking a big concept, breaking it down in five minutes or less quick, easy, something to give you to chew on, on the way to work and give you something during the week to think about. So any, anything at Rocky Garza out there, I'd love to connect with you. Fantastic. I, I was wondering back in my mind, are those real? Because those eyebrows are so amazing. I mean, Rocky's got real, oh, there they are. All Very distinguished look. I mean, yeah. And, and, yeah, this is a good looking person I'm looking at. It makes me want to look at him. Uh, <laughs> I hope that's not too weird to hear. So, no, it's not. I, I'll take it all day. <laughs> here's here. And by the way, in his background, there is a little back backdrop back there. And then the words be confident are in there. So I love that. I love this has been really cool, man. Just just to sit and jam with you and hear this life story. I'm on the, on the edge of my seat. And where is time gone? This has been amazing. Uh, normally, there's a lightning round. And I'm just going to hit you with one question. The one question mm-hmm. is when you hear the words eternal optimist, what is eternal mm-hmm. optimist? What might that mean to you, Rocky? Yeah, great question. I think when I hear the word eternal optimist, it is a, uh, a mindset to be able to look at the world in such a way that no matter where you are, what's happening, what you're facing, it's to keep your eyes projected further than the feet in front of you, to give an eternal view and the fact that there is good to be found, there is always going to be good to be found, that optimism is not that the glass is half full, it's that if you keep your eyes gazed far enough in front of you, that there's always good to be found if you're willing to see it. Woo! All right, man. Love you, brother. Thanks for being on today, Mr. Rocky Garza. Appreciate you, man. Ha, ha, ha.